Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. In this episode, Dorsey interviews another special guest that will give you hope and inspire you. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining me for another episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Today we have um, Lathan Kraft with us as, as our guest. He is an international best-selling author, speaker, and business owner who believes hope and belonging are basic necessities and the search isn't supposed to be a country club. Lathan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Dorsey, such an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Would you share with us some of your story and what you have been through in your life? Yeah, so I grew up as, um, I grew up without a mom and a dad. My uh, mom passed away when I was seven, and so I was raised by my grandparents. Um, met Jesus in middle school. So then I, I became a pastor um, but pretty much right on my adult years. I was a pastor until this past year, the time I was recording this past year. And then I stepped out of full-time ministry because I realized the people God was calling me to reach were not found in church, uh, were actually found on the outskirts of church. Now, you wrote um, the leper, the book, The Leper in the Church, and that's some of what we're going to talk about today. And when I, you know, looking over your profile, I saw that you wrote that book. I was like, yeah. that's a book I got to read, and that's a book I got to, you know, <laughs> talk with, you um, know, lacing about. Yeah. And, you know, you talk, you mentioned talking about lepers in the church. Can you explain to us what is the definition of the leper in the modern day world and church? Yeah, so <laughs> it could be multiple things. But the leper, uh, for the purpose of the book, the leper in the church is the, those who have a mental illness. Um, and so the lepers, when we read in the Bible, obviously, they are always in the outskirts of the town. Back then in biblical times, you had to scream if you were a leper. You had to scream that you were unclean. But really in the modern day church, we we perceive a lot of people who have mental illness or any other kind of illness, really for that matter, as saying that they're unclean, but they're not saying it. And so we treat them as a leper. We don't really congregate with them. We don't really um, ask them their story or really try to commune with them at the table. Instead, we keep them at a safe distance and, and at, at the outskirts of our heart, if you will, um, and don't let them into the inner recesses of who we are. When Jesus actually, God in the flesh, came and communed with the leper. He touched the leper. He did all these things with the leper. That's who he spent most of his time with. But us in the American church have a really hard time with uh, communing people who maybe look or act or say or just be different than we are. And as a pastor, I struggle with depression a lot. And I remember vocalizing that as a pastor on a Sunday morning in the pulpit and was basically told, man, what a great sermon. So nobody, nobody knows what to do with real or with the mental illness or with whatever, whatever's going on. And the people who have left the church have left because they felt like the leper of, man, I'm not welcome in this place. And so therefore this place isn't for me. How can the church do a better job of handling the lepers of the church, especially today, and especially with those that have mental health issues? Yeah, I think it's really found in practicing what we preach. I mean, if we if we say that we, we follow Jesus, then we should probably start acting like him. Um, and Jesus hung out with lepers. He talked with lepers. He wanted to know leper stories. He he was all about the individual and the human. And so I think a lot of times when we go to church, we look for people that are a lot like us, um, that really just kind of live the same life we do, when really we should be looking for the people who feel like the outcast, who feel like the broken, who feel like the outsider, and talking to them, asking them their story, asking them what, they, uh, what they've been through, because the value is found in the story. So if you ask somebody their story, they automatically feel valued. And then that diminishes the idea of a leper in the first place. And so we have to stop saying, come as you are, if we don't actually believe come as you are. Because come as you are means, okay, I can come with my depression, with my schizophrenia, with my whatever illness I can come, right? Because it says come as you are. 
but actually we say, come as we want you to be. If we're, if we're being honest, come, come as I'm comfortable with, which isn't the gospel, which isn't Jesus. Right. That was the century ago we see from the Bible that the lepers would get kicked out of their cities, their homes, people would treat them or as that they didn't exist. And the lepers' vocabulary would be unclean, unclean. So my question is this, have we as a society changed much from the way that we treat the lepers of today? And from what I'm hearing you say already, that's really not the case. I love the way you phrased that question, Dorsey. Um, no, I don't think we've changed at all. We may we we don't have the power to kick them out of our villages like they did back then, um, but we do have the power to say you can't come to our church by our actions. And so through our actions, which I'm writing a book right now, where one of my main pieces is people don't follow your commands; they follow your culture. And so if your culture is saying one thing and your command is saying another, for instance, using the same illustration, if your culture, if your commands say come as you are, but your culture says actually don't, people are following the don't. They're not following the come as you are. And so with our actions, no, forget our commands. With our actions, we're actually saying, yeah, you still belong in the outskirts. You're still unclean. But don't call us out on it because we don't want to look bad in the city, but you're not welcome here. You have a quote in your book that says, simply put, most of us, myself included, walk around like we are still under the old covenant. We ignore people that look different than us, act different than us, or smell different than us. We ignore the leper. We may even have gotten to the point where we can internally hear unclean when we walk past them May we rid ourselves of self-centeredness. We do a really good job at talking about the lepers, pointing them out to our cliques in the church, doing everything that we can to make them known, but not taking the time to know them. But if the church truly is to be like Christ, shouldn't we respond with acceptance, compassion, and the desire to build relationships? Here's another quote in your book that stuck out to me. To my mentally ill friends, you are not in your situation because of a sin. You are not in your situation because you didn't play hard enough. You are not in your situation because God loves you less. You are in your situation because your situation gives you a story, a story that beckons the dead in the church awake, the fake in the church to live authentically, and discipleship, and to have no limitations. And I, you know, like I said, I read your book, and, you know, I thought it was a, a great book, and I, you know, would recommend anybody to that is listening to go out and to buy your book, because I think, you know, I was highlighting a lot of your book, and, you know, some of it even stepped on my toes a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... I, I love the idea. You mentioned the, the first quote, the old covenant quote, and I've gotten some pushback on that myself. Um, but when we really think about what the old covenant was and the old covenant rules and the old covenant legalities, uh, it was all family units. And so you, again, like I said earlier, you hung out with people who looked, smelled, acted like you did. But Jesus literally flipped that idea on its head when he came. Like he, he, he basically said, Forget whatever whatever you think is, is what it looks like to follow God. I'm raising the bar on what it says to follow God. And so Jesus came and, and embraced the prostitute. He embraced the leper. He embraced all these people that church people shun, w whether in word or deed. And that's what he's calling us to do. That's, what, that's the gospel that I read. It's just this, I, I, I can't read past the stories of, so many, so many stories that I've received. And just bef even before writing, I wrote the book because I heard all the stories, Dorsey. Like I heard the stories of people who are told that their schizophrenia is a sin or are told that their uh, depression is a demon possession. And there's so many different things that it's, that's not everything has to be that way. What, what if, what if I am the way I am because it gives me a story? And what if the story actually leads people to Jesus? And that's really, that's really where, the leper has a voice, but where we give the leper a voice back is saying, 
Hey, you're not, you're not your problem. Well, if you want to call it a problem, that's not, you're not, you're not that. That doesn't define you. Jesus defines you and he calls you a son and a daughter. Right. Do you, if I had somebody ask me a while ago, or, you know, maybe give me a little bit of encouragement a while ago to maybe step out and, you know, maybe do a vocal search for, you know, people with disabilities or, you know, people who, who are different than everybody else. But I thought about it and really, you know, if you were to do that, to me anyway, I would feel like you're isolating those people from being able to um, communicate or to fellowship with other Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What What do you think about that? Could there be a search for people with disability or for people with, you know, other uh, health issues, like, I guess you can say. I think there's not a safe place right now in most churches for people with disabilities, I would say. Um, and, and that's just from personal experience and from stories that I've heard as well. So if we, there's two sides to this coin, right? Like when you said I had, you had somebody encourage you, to start a, a church for people who have disability, uh, I got chills because I, I could start a church for people with disabilities, but they're not going to listen to me like they listen to you, right? Like the, you being there and the power of empathy over sympathy is one that can lead a movement greater than anybody else could. On the same time, yes and amen, those people should be in community with the local church or whatever it may be. But a lot of time, the reason they're not in church is because they've been shunned by the local church. And so at the, at the same time, while we can encourage that, I think COVID has taught us the power of the internet and said, well, actually, we can meet virtually and still have authenticity. Um, and I think that's why and would, and would be a holy, holy moment if we had a virtual church for people with disability, because the reason they'd be coming to you is because they've tried the local church first and it didn't work for them. In your book, you talk about several different types of mental illnesses, and you know later on maybe we'll discuss more of them. But that yeah. one that you talk about, and you brought it up already, is anxiety. Tell us why anxiety is a mental health issue, and what is the difference between having normal anxiety and when does it go into anxiety as a mental health issue? Yeah. So it is very common to worry um, and to fret. It is, it is commonplace for that. When anxiety crosses over into a, a mental issue is when it can no longer be controlled. Um, it is overwhelming. It is every thought of every second of every day. And the only way to make it go away in a, in a sense away or to really to, to put a pause on it is probably through medication. And so anxiety as a mental illness is different because it, it literally controls everything. It's as if a machine is operating your head and everything you do and everything you think is operated by this machine and your anxiety is completely out of control to where it affects and, and it controls your decision making ability and everything about your life. As opposed to like, if I have anxiety about what's going on tomorrow, sure, that's, that's normal. But and and this pandemic has really made all of us even more anxious about a lot. But the the generalized anxiety disorder as a mental illness is the overwhelming, overarching. And the way I like to tell people is you'll know it if you have it kind of kind of illness, because, you know, you can't live just the same way you've been living. There's a verse in the Bible that says in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything by very prayer and petition, we grant you re- re- but they grant be, but they grant you request may be made known to God, and it goes on, but you know you talk about that in your book, and when and how should we re- share this verse with someone, especially if they tell us that they have anxiety in our lives? Great question. Um, 
If I told you I had a sin problem and you told me your answer to me was don't sin, that wouldn't help me out, right? And so if somebody comes to you and says, I have anxiety, and you give them a verse that says don't be anxious, it doesn't help the point. Um, because the, the thing they're struggling with, they're at their need you to meet them where they are. And so to use that verse with somebody who has, who has actual anxiety is to actually do them a disservice and to almost let them know that in, in, in Jesus, in the eyes of Jesus, they're not welcome, which is just not false, which is not true at all. And so a proper response to somebody who has anxiety is number one, asking their story, where did it come from? Like what, what, what? What, what's the root of the anxiety and then leading them into an encounter with Jesus who meets them where they are, as opposed to giving them a Pharisee type response, which is, Oh, don't the, the, the book says don't. So don't, which is not a, the, the, the gracious, most gracious and loving response. Another thing that, you know, came out of your book to me or popped out in your book to me was that you mentioned several Bible verses in your book, and you described how these can be used to talk about mental illnesses or mental health. Yeah. Can you talk about those and tell us why some of those verses are talking about mental health? Yeah, so there are there are multiple uh, verses in the Bible. I don't have the book right in front of me, so I can't look at the verses, but there, there are multiple verses in the Bible that are preached and practiced in in one sense, but could easily apply to other senses. And so uh, we often forget that people who wrote the Bible and lived in biblical times were like us, um, were human, had a mental side, had a spiritual side, had an emotional side, had a physical side, were a holistic human being. And so when people are talking about different aspects of Scripture, and I encourage you to read it, um, they're not just talking about the physical relational. They could they could also be implying the holistic self, which which would include the mental, uh, which is often neglected um, when either counseling or teaching those those verses. Another mental health issue that you talk about in your book is bipolar. Can you tell us exactly what is bipolar? Because I don't know if a lot of people you know. They know what the word bipolar is, but I don't know if they exactly understand what bipolar is by definition. Yeah, great question. Um, bipolar is the complete extreme to go from calm to chaos and the flip of a dime. Um, the chaos normally is described as a manic, um, a manic episode, and a manic episode if you ask counselors or people who have experienced it firsthand um, is really an ultra human experience. There, there are different types of manics that can happen with different types of people, but a manic is when you have no control and just anger and just rage consumes every ounce of your being and you respond and you act out in that way. So bipolar is the act of going from, hot to cold, left to right, those two, those types of polar opposites and the flip of a dime. As a, and it's, it's not the slow progression, which a lot of time, Dorsey, when we don't know how to handle somebody and like we're talking to them, I've heard it said about me and other people, we jokingly say you, you're bipolar. Like just this idea of, or you, what you're doing is bipolar. You can't, you're, you're lofty. Like, but Bipolar is so serious and man, it can cause a lot of damage. And so it's not something to be joke, joked about or taken lightly when the entire person could affect other people and could affect devastation to multiple families. And so bipolar is when um, you and I could be talking right now and in a matter of a second, something could happen and I would flip and be a completely different being and not Lathan anymore. You mentioned in your book about Timothy and and Timothy uh, chapter one verse seven, where he writes about having the power, love, and sound mind. Can you explain to us what each one means? Yes. So, um, also another verse in certain contexts, not to go to somebody with mental illness, because. Um, 
power. God is not giving us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Other translations say self-control. Um, but power is a very harnessed power, a very righteous power, um, a power that does not make anybody less than, um, does not make anybody less human, um, but is a selfless power. Love, unconditional love, a love that does not seek for the benefit of themselves, but seek for the benefit of others. Sound mind, self-control, a, a ability to be self-aware and to harness all of your being, all of your humanity into a controlled state as opposed to an uncontrolled, um, uh, no self-awareness mentality. You have another quote that you wrote in your book. And as I was reading this quote, I was thinking to myself, I have a pretty good idea. We won't, you know, we won't discuss who, who wrote it because only you know who wrote it. But I was thinking to myself, I have a great idea who, who wrote this verse. But anyway, it, you're, the quote is, there seems to be a new movement creeping across the American church that is all about happiness and good feelings. A well-known speaker associated with this movement has said multiple times, God just wants you to be happy. There are two obvious things that are wrong with this statement. One, it is heretical. Two, the statement implies that if you are happy, you are either not doing what God wants for your life, or God doesn't want anything to do with you. Both statements justifiably so terrify lepers through a different perspective, many people will say he just is enough. Can you go into that a little bit more deeply? Explain <laughs> that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, man, it's rampant in the culture now. This idea, whether whether we're trying to communicate it to people or just through our actions, the name of being trendy, we're trying to say it to people. God wants you to be happy. Friends, the gospel that I read is all about suffering, um, all about brokenness, all about pain. Jesus is embodied fully and, and comes down to meet us in our pain. Jesus didn't come to a concert where we we're all happy and we and he just like was a fanboy and he said, Hey, like, meet me after. He came to our brokenness. He was born in a stable. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't. So, so, so the way to meet Jesus, the way to be most like Christ, Paul says, is to bear in our suffering, so be, to, to understand who he is the most through our pain, through our sufferings. And so when we tell people God wants us to be happy, where, as, as I mentioned in the book, that's not, first off, that, just run, run away as fast as you can from any type of teaching that says anything like that. But second off, what we're implying is that if we're, if we are, if we aren't constantly happy, then we are not like Christ. But Christ, I show me a verse in the Bible and in like for verbatim, direct quote where it says Jesus was happy. I don't read any, there, there's not a verse in the Bible. And even in the Old Testament, people, the church of the modern day likes to think of the Old Testament as some angry God. So the opposite of happy. And so this idea that God wants us to be happy, why would he want us to be something that he is not? And so just just in that sense, it doesn't make sense, but also we're giving people a wrong idea that if they're in pain, they're not like Christ, but actually when they're in pain, they're most like Christ. When we think of the word blog, we think of being prideful, and we sometimes think we can't have blog or be proud of ourselves, especially when we look at the things or the things that we deal with in our everyday life. How do we realize that we can be proud of of ourselves, even with the sin that we deal with, regardless of what we have done? It's a great question. Um, Paul says it in Romans 7 and 8. He, Romans 7, uh, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't do. So this idea of his self-reflection, self-awareness of saying, man, I'm a, I've messed up. <laughs> like I, I have done some terrible things. I mean, Paul, obviously in the former life, Saul was, he, he was the chief sinner. Even he said it. But at the same time, Jesus commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, which is the first of the greatest, which is the greatest commandment. 
how can you love your neighbor if you don't love yourself? And the issue is a lot of people love their neighbor like they love themselves. And so the, the projection of our hatred for ourselves comes out in our hatred for our neighbor. You can look any, anywhere on social media and you'll see that. Just my, what I don't like about me, I'm going to project onto somebody else and say I don't like them. But really, Jesus isn't calling, he's not calling us into this idea of like your best self now, which by the way is that same type of <laughs> preaching. Um, but it's a, hey, you self love is a thing in my kingdom. You can love yourself because I created you as a, for what we read in First Peter, you or First and Second Peter, you are a royal nation, a holy priesthood. You are, you're a champion. I, I, you are my most prized possession. Ephesians 420, you're my masterpiece. At the same time, we can have an awareness that is holy, a holy and accurate awareness of who we are, but also a beautiful appreciation for what God has taken the time to make in us. What is the difference between God never being never failing and God being un- unconditional? Oh, that's a great question. The difference between God being never failing and God being unconditional. Um, I... I think, man, that's a really good question, Dorsey. I think in the, in his never failingness, he never runs out. And so I don't, I don't view failure as in the way humans view failure. I view failure as empty, if that makes sense. So he never fails as in he never gives up, which actually complements his unconditionality of I'm never giving up on you. I'm never failing. Therefore, my supply never runs out. I'm always lavishing. I'm always, no matter how far you've run, Luke 15, you can always come home. One other statement I want to point out in your book here before we end. It says, another, um, it says, if you're not reaching the same people that Jesus reached, are you even preaching the same gospel Jesus preached? That's a great, you know, quote that, you know, again, that hit me. The issue is, and we can talk anything, you can fill in the blank here, but segregation, whether that be racial, socioeconomic, political, all those things, segregation exists still rampantly in the American church. Rampantly. I mean, you go to church people for the large part that look a lot like you do, live in the same type of things that you live in. And so this idea, which... Jesus spent most of his time, if not, well, most of his time with people who were the complete opposite of him. He had access to all all of the wealth that he could have wanted, everything he could have ever wanted, your best life now, he had access to it if he wanted it. Instead, he chose to be like the poor. He chose to be like the prostitute. He chose to be like the sinner and dine and commune with them. When really the church... And I have such a hope for the church because of Jesus. But the church is doing a very good job at calling out the sinner, but not sitting with the sinner. As we end, is there, what encouragement you know, would you give to someone with a mental health issue that may listen to this later on? And what encouragement would you give to the church you know, in general that, you know, to give them you know, help and give them instruction on how to handle somebody with a mental health issue? It's a great question. Um, To my mentally ill friend, exactly like I said in the book, you are not your situation. You're not your problem. You're a child of God. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, you've been bought with a price you can never repay. Um, Blood was shed on your behalf so that your situation in right now gives you a story that can lead people to a man named Jesus later. To the church, I would say, to view the church as the mentally ill friend, <laughs> to view how you operate church through the lens of somebody with a mental illness, how would they receive, perceive um, the things you're doing, the experience you're providing? And if you're not viewing church as the mentally ill friend, at the very least view church through the lens of a prostitute who came to Jesus and just fell on his feet and worshiped. But there's so many prostitutes, 
sinners, whatever, fill in the blank, who were terrified to go to church because a sign on the door says, do not enter. It doesn't, but in their mind it does because they've been told and the actions are saying, you're not welcome here. So the American church, to be like Jesus, has to view church through the lens of people Jesus reached. If we're not doing that, we're not being the church. You mean, so let's be the church today. Listen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Where can people, you know, pick up your book or get more information about you? Yeah, so my book is available on Amazon and Blood in the Church. I have a website, LathanCraft.com, has everything there. I also have a podcast called The Other Side of the Church, which exists to tell the stories the church won't. So um, LathanCraft.com has all the links, including the book there. So you, you can just check that website out. Awesome. Guys, thank you again, and girls, thank you again for joining us on another episode of the Dorsio Show. Please check out my website, dorsioisministries.com, and please like and uh, share this episode. And until next time, God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Please like, share, and tell others about the show. Also, please check out the other podcast episodes. And if you would like, donate to this podcast and buy Dorsey a coffee. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.